Hi, folks. Welcome to another episode of Film Study. This is Ken McCusick, and it's time for this week's One Last Thing with co-host Slava Cooperstein. Slava, how are you doing? Can't complain after a win like that, Ken. Nope. Great win. And uh, we're talking about what to do this week. And we hope, we've always got our little things we can we can, uh, we can either pick on or add to or what could be better about the offense or this kind of thing. But, but in this week, we want to just enjoy the moment here. Big win over the Bills. Home primetime win. Had one of the really nice runs in Ravens history. And we thought we'd do those two things. Talk about the greatest runs in Ravens history. Talk about the greatest primetime wins in Ravens history. But to start us off here, Slava, why don't you take us through one of your favorite runs of all time? Or am I starting? <laughs> yeah, um, I can. Uh, yeah, you're starting, Ken. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I'll, yeah. I'll go ahead and start. Okay, well, the, the number five run on our combined list of runs uh, was Willis McGahee, a 77-yard run, but maybe not the one you're thinking of. This this one came against Oakland on 1-3-10. So the Ravens were um, in the last game of the season. They needed to win to earn a spot in the playoffs, and they beat Oakland uh, in, in Oakland. And McGahee's 77-yard run, which put the Ravens up 13-3 to at the time, was really the big play in that ball game. But that's that's the first one on my list. And uh, and Ken, actually, yeah, um, you know, I was wondering whether this was the stiff arm from hell um, against Hiram Eugene, and in fact was. McGahee, of course, was a, uh, you know, a very decisive runner, um, had a really good nose for the end zone, of course, in short yardage situations, wasn't necessarily known for his super long touchdowns, although he appears on this list twice. And I mean, I think it is a well aptly named stiff arm from hell because he really put Hiram Eugene of the Oakland Raiders on his butt. And it was just a ferocious run. All righty. And uh, I, I will go ahead and go with mine. Uh, one, one of my runs, favorite runs is uh, from one of my, two of my favorite runs from one of my favorite games ever in Baltimore history. And we'll be discussing this twice is the um, uh, back-to-back uh, touchdown runs uh, from Willis McGahee and LaRon McClain uh, at um, the last game at Texas Stadium in 2008. So this was a pretty special game um, for, for a lot of reasons, not the least of which that Jerry Jones thought that the Baltimore Ravens were going to be terrible and um, mm-hmm. sort of picked us as a, a sort of a farewell swan song kind of um, uh, opponent. Uh, to close out the historic Texas Stadium. And what he didn't count on is uh, McGahee splitting the defenders for a 77-yard touchdown, then, um, uh, you know, be- becoming immediately one of the longest runs in Ravens history, um, followed by uh, LeBron McLean doing the exact same thing almost. Uh, you know, the defense was in sort of the same kind of got sucked in and and uh, and McLean and the announcers couldn't could not believe. Um, uh, I, I remember it was uh, um, it yeah. was a uh, Dion. Yeah, Dion. I mean, he 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 just sounded disgusted. Uh, you know, at, at what Dallas was doing defensively, and uh, you know, Laron McLean. You want to talk stiff arms from he- from hell? He immediately stiff arms a uh, Ken Dallas. Hamlin. Def- yeah, that's right, Ken Hamlin, and runs right over him, and 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 just you know goes the distance. Uh, closing out the uh, Dallas Cowboys in in shame on that day and uh, letting them get on with their uh, demolition festivities. Their their celebration and whatnot. Uh, I, it, they were the two longest runs by an opponent in Texas Stadium history, and they occurred in the last two minutes and change of the last game there. And that that still is remarkable to me. You know, the t- the stadium was around for 37, 38 years, whatever it was. I think it opened in seventy or seventy one. And uh, and there were no other longer runs um, by an opponent, so uh, that was pretty cool. I'll move on. Uh, Jamal Lewis's 295-yard day is remembered by a lot of people. The signature run from that day was the opening 82-yard run on his very first carry. Uh, in fact, he had 105 yards after two carries, but his first was for 82 from the 18-yard line for a touchdown. Uh, set up the whole day. Uh, it was said that uh, Ogden went over to him at halftime with 183 yards and said, let's let's go get 300 kind of thing. They just came up a, a, a hair short. But uh, what a day for Jamal and one of three very long runs he had. He had 49, a 62, and an 82 that day uh, and wrote to 295. Yeah, this is a run and a game that I would recommend to 
any fan who might be, you know, maybe just remember Jamal Lewis in his sort of last couple of years in Baltimore, uh, where he became a little less um, explosive, still very tough to bring down, still very dangerous. I mean, but this run and this game really showed what a lethal combination of explosive, you know, fast contact balance. Yeah. I mean, you know, you know, it had everything right. And and Jamal Lewis really was um, a complete running back. And this was, you know, a great example of that and route to an historic season for him. Uh, so the next one that we've got is uh, of course, what we saw on Sunday, um, Derek Henry, 87 yards versus Buffalo on Sunday night. Uh, first, first snap of the first game. Um, uh, you know, and not w- w- without, without spoiling, uh, you know, what's number one on our list. It certainly reminded me of the number one, mm-hmm. uh, uh, run, run on our list. And, it, you know, at the end of the day, I, you know, what I kind of view this run from Derrick Henry as sort of representing is, you know, it, you know, whatever, this is going to represent what the best of the Derrick Henry acquisition had. And this game kind of represents that too, right? Because it's not only did Derrick Henry do extremely well with this run, but you know, the O-line that we decided to go young and cheap on um, blocked well for him. And of course, you know, leading up to this, uh, leading up to this run, of course, the Ravens got a three and out um, defensively right before then, uh, sort of uh, kind of showing that um, at least for one week, uh, the front office's decisions on how they were going to allocate their resources and towards Derrick Henry uh, really were, was going to pay off. Uh, it, it, uh, the, the amazing thing about the run, I do not believe any defender ever touched him on the play. Um, he didn't run through any hole where he was close to being touched. I, if I'm wrong about that, I, I, it's possible, but I believe it was 87 yards before contact on that run, uh, which is just incredible. I mean, the, the Ravens have had a good year for before contact, but one of the things Henry came to Baltimore for was the ability to get level two opportunities for first contact. And uh, he made the most of this one and fantastically blocked up play um, really shows in a lot of ways how the, uh, eligible receivers on the Ravens really e- excelled in their blocks. It, the linemen were fine too, but the, but the eligible receivers were outstanding. Patrick Ricard having the great uh, kind of a trap block uh, in there as well, being one of the big ones. But uh, great run. I, I know I'll never forget the look of it. It's a visual memory. It's already burned in yep. my mind, and I'm sure for a lot of us it is. Statement game on national television. There you go. I'll go to the the, the number one run of all time. Uh, you have to go back to 2010 in the uh, in January. So it was after the 2009 season. That Ravens team had squeaked into the playoffs the week before with McGahee's 77-yard run. Uh, but it was a very, very good football team. In fact, I would say it was the best team of the first five hardball years. The 2012 team won the championship. Other teams won 12 games. Um, the 2008 you know, team had gone to, to the uh, AFC championship game as well as an 11 and lost it. But the 09 team had an unbelievable offensive line and uh, the best of, of, of that era. And this game, it really showed up. They ran the ball right down the Patriots' throat 52 times. The first play from scrimmage, again, very much like the Henry play, very much like the Jamal play, all the first play from scrimmage. Um, they're at the 17-yard line. Rice runs it. 83 yards right up the middle. Um, This running was a little more maze-like that game. Rice squeezed through some very tight holes, and he squeezed through immediately into level two. There are a pair of combination blocks, one by Grubbs and one by Yonda getting up into level two. Yonda took care of Guyton um, after he pushed Will Fork uh, off at center. And there's still an enduring image for me of Will Fork um, discussing what had happened to him on that play. And, you know, using a fist to punch into his open palm um, and indicating that he got pushed out of the way by the by uh, Yanda on the play. And uh, it, it's one of his highlights, certainly, in the Hall of Fame career of Marshall Yanda. And, and for Ray Rice, certainly, it, it would be the highlight. Um, but he outrun, outran Merriweather then uh, the last few yards. He really realized Rice had some speed as well uh, as a player. So very exciting uh, uh a terrific run and it set set off a route of new england that was one of the few black marks on a 20-year period of outstanding playoff football the one team that they were really afraid of playing at home 
was was the Baltimore Ravens. And I, I really think that feeling started with this game. I believe that this is the first game that Baltimore ever beat the New England Patriots on home. Uh, I mean, rather uh, playoff or regular season. And uh, and it was there. There was sort of a little bit of a rivalry bubbling because mm-hmm. of a couple games where some kind of. Uh, you know, Patriot type things that you might expect. Brandon Merriweather was a uh, head hunting safety who had injured Todd Heap. Um, uh, Suggs got some ridiculous flags and some re- regular season game because Tom Brady whined for them, mm-hmm. you know, but it's not really a rivalry until you beat the other team. Right. And so not only did we beat them for the first time, but we beat them in the playoffs and it did not get better for the Patriots after that run. I mean, we, we demolished them as one of the most comprehensive Ravens playoff wins in history. Um, and, and, you know, I just love every second of it. The, the score doesn't even reflect properly just how one-sided that game was. I think it's 30, 33, 17. I think they won it, end up winning by 16. Um, but it was, maybe it was 33, 14. Yeah. They might've might been 19. They might have scored off of a uh, special teams flub, if I recall correctly, uh, maybe like a kickoff uh, or, uh, yeah, like a, a, a kickoff return fumble or a, or a punt, uh, so, so, some kind of special teams mistake. They got, they got a short field. Uh, mm-hmm. The game really wasn't a, a, as close as the score suggests. 20, 24 to nothing in the first quarter. So, uh, all right, well, we're going we're gonna to move on from there, and we're going to talk about, you know, this, this was obviously one of the really statement great uh, prime time wins in history. The Ravens have a lot of those. Um, you know, one of the things that's interesting about this is the Ravens have played 86 primetime games in their history. 49 of those have been on the road and 37 at home. I don't know why, but I do know the Ravens are very upset about that relationship. And they should be because the Harbaugh era, they've been nearly unbeatable at home. They've been 21 and three at home in primetime. And of course, this year, they're two and four in terms of home and road primetime games but we're gonna we're gonna talk about our favorite 10 games we got a list of five each we're gonna kind of go through these pretty quickly but start us off Slava. yeah so i'm gonna start off with harbowl number one which was uh, uh 49ers at ravens uh thanksgiving 2011 um so it's a thanksgiving game it's the first meeting of the harbaugh brothers as head coaches so it's already uh, a very special game and I view this game as the game that absolutely 100% solidified Terrell Suggs' Defensive Player of the Year campaign. Um, the 49ers, who were a rapidly ascending key- team, uh, you know, might sound funny to somebody uh, who, who goes back and looks and sees that Alex Smith was at the helm. But in fact, Alex Smith took them to a, a NFC uh, championship game that year, as well as the following year. Um, but you know, Alex Smith started the year as the quarterback in 2012 before Kaepernick mm-hmm. uh, took. So he, you know, was playing qu- the best football of his career at that point um, under Jim Harbaugh's tutelage. And Suggs, of course, uh, you know, had a monster game. He had three sacks, which does not account for how badly he wrecked that offensive line all all game. And uh, the team had nine total sacks, which was pretty remarkable. Um, the, and, and the 49ers were just a, a, a really excellent team that, that just came in probably thinking that they could hold their own and what they found was a buzzsaw. Known for an outstanding offensive line at that time too. And the, the nine sacks, the, one of the things that, that I've heard on, I don't remember if it's a sound FX or a game of the week. I think it might be, it might be a sound FX. Cause I remember there's a whole lot of drawing from Ray Rice in that game. Uh, he's talking to the other team constantly, which is like, I, I didn't really know this was a big part of Ray's game, but if you didn't, you, you, you got it in this video, no doubt about it. But anyway, uh, he the, they had Alex Smith on the sidelines and he kept saying, talking about seeing a lot of color. And he meant that he kept saying, seeing the Ravens uniforms flashing in front of his eyes as he's trying to concentrate down the field. And, uh, and it was really bothering. So that's always a good sign when you get the, get the opposing quarterback seeing color. And, uh, and Ken, I would say for my money, of the first five uh, teams leading up to the 2012 Super Bowl, I would, I would put uh, the 2011 team, I think, uh, as, as my pick for the best, just because they had a really, I, I felt, the best balance of offense and defense during that mm-hmm. time. Uh, and I think that Flacco was, by that point, a huge asset, whereas, uh, you know, Earlier in 2009, you know, he was still kind of figuring his way out. A lot of good teams to pick from, but I think 11 was my favorite. All right. Fair enough. 
Uh, and it's my turn, right? We'll yep. go to the Cleveland win over Cleveland, 47, 42 in 2020. So many things to talk about in this game, but uh, the Ravens were trailing, I believe by, yeah, by one point in the fourth quarter, they had a fourth and five too far to kick the field goal. Though Chucker supposedly ran up to Harbaugh to try and get it done. And Willie Sneed ran up to Harbaugh wondering if it was his turn to go in the football game. Cause Trace McSorley had just been hurt and out of the bathroom. Came Lamar Jackson <laughs> on fourth and five in one of the most iconic moments in team history. He runs out of the field just as they go to the two minute warning, I believe. And then <laughs> they go, and here comes Lamar Jackson. Jackson, of course, ran on the field, rolled right, um, found uh, Marquise Brown for the touchdown, and uh, and the rest is history. The, Cleveland did end up tying the game. Lamar drove him down the field again, game winning field goal, for, put it up 45 42. They had time for a kickoff. They kicked it, kicked it deep, the uh, but but not into the end zone. So it was, so it was, or maybe it wasn't the end zone, but it was returned anyway. And then they had a series of laterals, which ended in a safety and a 47-42 Ravens win. The Ravens were three and a half point favorites. And just after the game, they went to the show Bad Beats on ESPN, which is Scott Van Pelt's show. Uh, he may still have that, I don't know, but it's but it's it's hilarious. The show is generally very funny, and. He didn't even have to say anything. He just looks at the camera, kind of raises an eyebrow. <laughs> I guess I mean, <laughs> makes all these gestures with his hands, but he doesn't say a word. And the, the support staff there in the room is laughing hysterically at him doing this. But anyway, great game. It's it's so funny to me that the Ravens still maintain that this was anything other than bubble guts on Lamar's part. You know, just you know, it happens happens to the best of us. He comes in. It really, you know, when the I, I remember exact the exactly what you're saying when the announcers like, and here comes Lamar Jackson. It felt like a wrestler entering, right? Like, yeah. you, you know, it was uh, you know really just dramatic remarkable stuff has showcased the special connection that Marquise Brown um and uh, and uh, Lamar Jackson had and you know uh, the rest is history so uh, the next one that i have on my list number 4 is 2021 versus uh, the Indianapolis Colts uh probably one of the most impressive comebacks in Ravens history uh the first you know, 48 minutes of the game were not very impressive. The Colts were up 25 to nine with 12 minutes left in the game. Uh, the offense, I think, up until, until that point had been sort of very anemic. Um, the Ravens did what exactly what teams should do in this situation and not worry about putting the ball in harm's way and just let it all fly, let it all hang out. Um, because it, 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 nothing I can't stand when somebody's like, you, you know, down 25. I think, I think the, um, Bills did this. They were down 25 points and they punted uh, yep. th this past week. And I, I asked to myself, why do coaches do this? A, a, a punt cannot do anything for you. Just toss it up. Maybe you'll get lucky. So in any event, the, the uh, Ravens luckily did not wave the white flag. Um, and at both the nine uh, minute and 38 uh, second mark and the 35 second mark, uh, the Ravens marched down the field and, and got two uh, touchdowns and I believe both two point conversions yep. were to Mark Andrews. So Mark Andrews accounted for, you know, 18, uh, sorry, 16 points um, in a, in, in that last 12 minutes tying the game up. And I think by that point you kind of think to yourself, okay, it's game over. We're going, it, it's sort of like a mile high miracle. When we tied it up, I kind of felt all of the momentum was headed our way. They must be dreading, you know, uh, the, the, uh, the overtime. And of course, uh, you know, five minutes and change left to go. Marquise Brown touchdown in overtime sealed it. And I believe it was pr probably Lamar's most impressive stat line, uh, ever in that game it's up there. Yeah. Yeah. He, he's, uh, he, he certainly has some great ones punctuating those two, um, touchdowns to tie the game in regulation was a huge blocked field goal by Calais Campbell in that game. It just that was a special magical night uh, all itself. There's there's been a few of those, but uh, but that was a great one. And uh, just to go over that stat line, th Lamar went 37 for 43, 442 yards, and four touchdowns, no interceptions, and uh, uh, passer you know, rating. Uh, pass rating was 140.5. Uh, there, there was a fumble, uh, that I believe, uh, was lost earlier in the game. 
Um, and so that sort of, I think, uh, put them, put them in a bind, but for that, you know, last 12 minutes plus overtime, Lamar was transcendent. All right, let me move on. Uh, there's two games from 2001. I want to make sure we don't forget that era of Ravens football. So it's had some great primetime wins. But in, in 2001, the one I excluded was the last game of the season, which is a rescheduled week due to 9-11. The Ravens needed a win. They beat the Vikings, four sacks by Peter Boulware. Terrible game, 19-3, to but the Ravens dominated as they needed to do. Um, the, the game I picked was from Tennessee at midseason, and the, the Titans were struggling to get back into the race after an 0-3 start. The Ravens went down there, and they had a 16-10 to lead as McNair drove the Titans down the field completed a pass to the one yard line had just enough time to get the team up the line of scrimmage for what was going to be fourth down. Okay. Peter Bulware was already celebrating and he came back on sides, but he touched the lineman as he did it. The officials stood aside for seven minutes, six minutes and in, in that range, uh, trying to decide what to do. And finally the, 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 the first official came out with, with a play of this magnitude, which he should have never started, I think, because it doesn't the play the magnitude of the play doesn't should not matter at all for officiating purposes. But he started with that. He said, you know, as soon as as the defender touched the offensive lineman, that killed the play. So we'll have one snap. Uh, half the penalty is half the distance to the goal line. So from the half yard, from the one to the one half yard line, and the Ravens penetrated, stacked up McNair. McNair tried to go right and sharper, and Harris. Uh, Tag teamed him to take him down. The Ravens Ravens held on to win the game 16 to 10. Just a fantastic memory for me. Went down to that game uh, uh, in Tennessee with a friend, and um, I had all but given up. I, I As soon as the touchdown, they, they scored the touchdown, the play that didn't count, I walked up to, to, to kind of get ready to leave. And there's two problems with that. There's an extra point still to kick, and then there was a, a, a penalty that hadn't been assessed yet. But uh, uh, great football game. Yeah, I, 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 th- I think the announcing – uh, by the referee was the probably the thing that re- I remember the most about that. There are there are just some moments in in Ravens history, you know, Suggs with malice in his heart and yeah. the like that that you know once you hear it you'll never forget it. Um, Giving him and, the business, yeah, <laughs> that's right. And, and and it's just a you know great a great win against a, a, a major rival at that time. So the next one for me uh, is the Jackson Five uh, at the LA Rams in 2019. Um, one of the you know most comprehensive beatdowns and probably the I would say the smoothest that the Ravens offense looked in 2019, which is which is saying a lot because that mm-hmm. obviously was an impressive year. But it really just solidified the sort of the passing efficiency that that was there along with the running dominance. You know, the Ravens go there, win 45 to six. Um, and again, Jackson five, there's five um, uh, Lamar touchdowns. You got a pass to uh, pass to Hollywood, two passes to Hollywood Brown. I think two passes to Willie Sneed and one pass to Mark Ingram um, and uh, a couple, maybe some, some runs in there. Um, yeah, Primetime game in front of a pretty raucous LA crowd. Um, and it sort of enduring memory here for me is that the game was against, uh, so the Rams had acquired uh, Jalen Ramsey, mm-hmm. um, of course. And, and uh, because of that, we were able to um, acquire Marcus Peters, who uh, really helped transform a struggling defense into a, a, a pretty, pretty dominant one. Uh, and it just uh, Jalen Ramsey, uh, sort of, or rather Marcus Peters, jawing at Jalen Ramsey uh, throughout the course of the game and, and uh, really uh, providing the hype. He had, he had a lot of fun. He had a late interception in that game as well uh, to, to really seal the deal for him in a way. And I think that, that Eric Weddle, who was then with the Rams after four years with the Ravens, said it best. He said, they peeled our faces off. And it was really just, it's one of those, games that uh, that's a, that's about as one-sided as it gets in Ravens history. Yeah, complete dominance. I'll move on. I, I'll take the San Francisco game last year. This, this was two of the top DeVoa teams, DVOA teams, in the history of that, of the calculation of that metric, meeting on the same field. And, and the number, I believe they're number four and five all time at that point. And uh, the Ravens destroyed them. They, uh, uh, you know, knocked uh, Purdy out of the game. Purdy went to the sideline, was replaced, 
And he later asked, you know, can I go back in the game? Shanahan put a, put the play calling card up to his face and said something back to him that I can only imagine was, we're not taking a chance with you right now, kind of thing. <laughs> and, uh, uh, he he stayed out. Ravens had four or five interceptions in the game, one thirty three to nineteen, um, and uh, and thoroughly dominated that game. It wasn't as close as a, as that fourteen points would indicate. Yeah, I mean, this was during sort of like a real real stream of a string of uh, uh, games where the Ravens really were kind of dominating uh, some of the excellent teams. I mean, this is the reason that Lamar really solidified his MVP campaign last year is because he did it against the best that the NFL had to offer. And he did it, you know, week after week after week. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, it, it just, really speaks to uh, what a dominating uh, what, what a dominating team that 2023 Ravens team was. And uh, so for the next one, uh, I sort of hinted at this earlier, is 2008 at Dallas. This is one of my favorite games in Ravens history, of course. We did a whole episode on it. Uh, you know, in addition to those two phenomenal runs uh, from McGahee and uh, LaRon McClain, this, this is one of my favorite, maybe the favorite Derek Mason game. Um, in Baltimore uh, history, Derek Mason was, I, b- I believe, nursing a uh, previously dislocated shoulder or sprained shoulder, something like that. He was basically playing with one arm. An enduring kind of um, uh, image for me is uh, Mason running into the back, I believe, left corner of the end zone. Uh, you know, his uh, right arm sort of hugged, uh, you know, at you know, at his side, he can't move it whatsoever. So he basically, you know, and, and has a one armed catch uh, that Flacco places absolutely perfectly where uh, no other defender can, can get it. And I believe his celebration was uh, a round of applause with one hand, you know, <laughs> he did it, he just, just, you know, something like that. So that was, that, you know, that was a heroic, um, uh, heroic game for Derek Mason and sort of really, was one of the early examples of Joe Flacco sort of being able to step up in a pressure situation in a game that was nationally televised um, in a game that uh, I think very few pundits thought the Ravens were going to win. And they did so in a physical fashion uh, befitting the insult that they took at Jerry Jones, specifically selecting them to be the last team they hosted at Texas state critical game. On New on uh, Christmas Eve, they played that twelve twenty four oh eight, um, and the other Mason highlight from the game. I thought you're gonna gonna say this one is he had a remarkable fumble recovery downfield. The same issue with with you know the playing with one arm, et cetera, et cetera, that that sustained a drive. Uh, the other thing I can kind of remember about is is um, Sanders was in the booth, and Sanders had just uh, played for the Ravens recently in two thousand seven, I believe, maybe two thousand five. I may have the year wrong. Um, Mm, okay, it doesn't really matter much. But he last played for the Ravens, um, but he was he was calling plays out as the Ravens came to the line of scrimmage. Oh, they're getting Todd, Todd Heat matched on a fall linebacker here, and, and it just it just it, you know, they would line up. He'd know exactly what they what they were trying to do, and that was really Sanders as a as a defensive back, really being able to to look over an offense and see exactly what they were up to. But um, remarkable, and then of course he was not. I don't think he was particularly happy with the result having the. Um, even though he had been a Raven more recently, but uh, going down for the festivities afterward, he probably would have rather the mood be happier. And the Cowboys had had won the football game. My fa- one of my favorite things about the about what they did with that site after they imploded the stadium is they used it for uh, a staging area for materials to expand the highway system there. <laughs> have you ever been down to Dallas and <laughs> know how shitty traffic is down there? Um, it's just, it's all highways and overpasses. Land is flat. So you have to build your own kind of bridges over other roads where the highways intersect. Mm-hmm. And that creates this huge amount of material that's needed to material that's needed to, to create those roads. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's about all Texas Stadium was good for, if you ask, uh, if you ask me, and uh, and you're absolutely right about that Derek Mason fumble recovery. I mean, it, you know, he lucked out. I think it was Leron McLean who fumbled, and it just kind of popped into him. But for him to be as aware as he needed to be to react in that situation, and again, do it with one arm, you know, a legacy game for him. Yeah. Oh, it's I, my I, turn. I now. believe it's yours, Ken. Yeah. 
Okay, so you do that. Okay, so my my next uh, game is Sunday night. The game against Buffalo, I think, deserves a number two spot on my list. A huge statement win, old school Ravens vibe. Um, it, you know what's great about this game is they really shut down a quarterback and a fan base that is just constantly kind of jarring and jabbing. I, or right now, the the Twitterverse um, lights it up between anything. Kansas City, Buffalo, and Baltimore in terms of their quarterbacks. I know everybody's very defensive of, of, of their guys. Uh, we don't think they realize you know, why Lamar is really valuable because he makes all the other players on the field better. Um, they, they don't think we take passing stats seriously enough. <laughs> so it is what it is. But to, to really shut down Josh Allen, and he did everything but throw an interception in this game because he didn't throw a touchdown pass. He threw for, what, four-point-something yards per throw. It wasn't what That wasn't impressive. So – very impressive game for the Ravens defense. They really only had one blunder by Eddie Jackson, not covering the back end and, and letting a 52 yard play happen. Um, but they, they dominated this game thoroughly and they ran the ball right down the, the bill's throats and they could do nothing about it. So it was, it's one of the, one of the really great ones. I'm sure I'm going to think of this as one of the really great ones for many years. And, uh, you know, regarding that 52 yard play, it, it took, Probably, you know, I, I would imagine a top three pass of Josh Allen's career. Mm-hmm. I have seen there are very few passes that I've ever seen in my entire life that match what he did. He, you know, had about an inch of space uh, left before uh, he was uh, out of bounds, uh, it's, yeah. yeah, out of bounds and just contorting his body and just a real testament to his arm strength. Really impressive. It was. It was a great pass, and it, it, we, we need not take that away from him in any way just because it was a coverage blunder as well. I, I will say one other thing about this game that really makes it special. It had been almost three years since the Bills had been beaten by more than six points, and the Ravens destroyed them by 25. Um, it was a one-sided game. It did have that feel even momentarily in the third quarter. The Ravens were p- potentially going to blow an 11-point lead, but uh, they quickly turned it around on the Van Noy strip, and, and uh, the lights went out. Kind of had the feeling of a game where the Ravens really figured out what they were made of, uh, uh, you know, heading into the rest of the season. And I guess I guess we'll see. So my number one game, uh, my, my number one primetime game is 2012 uh, versus New England. This is a memorable game, memorable game for a number of reasons. Um, it is, uh, I believe, the first regular season win uh, against the New England Patriots mm-hmm. by the Baltimore Ravens. Uh, it uh, sort of started off on a somber note. Torrey Smith, unfortunately, uh, his uh, younger brother or half brother um, had died uh, in the more early morning hours uh, from, a, uh, I believe it was a motorcycle accident or a motorbike accident of some kind. Uh, so Torrey Smith decided uh, to play with a heavy heart. Um, and he had probably, I would say, along with the mile high miracle uh, and, uh, you, you know, probably his career defining game. Uh, had two touchdown receptions, if I recall correctly, um, really took over that game and played phenomenally. This was a game, of course, um, where early on in the season, the refs were on strike. They had the replacement refs going on, um, which led to two sort of hilarious, enduring moments uh, or images for me. Um, you know, Justin Tucker, again, this is a big game for him. This is one of his earliest, very, very clutch kicks. Third game. Yep. Yeah, third game. He uh, he kicks it, uh, I wouldn't exactly say through the uprights. He kicks it kind of over the uprights. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and so really took a reading of the uh, rules very closely by the officials to determine that that would count as being in. So the first enduring image for me, of course, is – uh, oh shoot! You, you mentioned his name before. Who was the defensive tackle? I can't think of his name right now. The um, uh, defensive he, uh, Will Fork. Vince yeah, Will Fork. Yeah. yeah. Um, I you know completely completely escaped my mind. So Will Fork, of course, ripping his helmet off and you know shouting at the officials when they called the field goal good. Uh, you can see him at the bottom of your screen, uh, just screaming and losing his mind. And of course, Belichick with the missed tackle uh, yes. on the <laughs> on, on the official. It's just for which he got fined, I think, pretty handsomely. He he went and uh, actually ran up as the official and all the other players are just running off the field. Game's over, right? It, you know, the, the final score has been called and Belichick lost his mind and runs over and and um and, 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 and tries to tug on the official who just doesn't doesn't even give him the time of day. It's phenomenal. Right. And, and he, he was he was furious. That was that was clear. OK, my last game, also a New England game in 2019. 
the eight no Patriots came to town to face Lamar Jackson and his MVP run. Um, and to, to put this in context, I mean, we know how good the Patriots were for that entire era, but the, the, the 2019 Patriots were on pace to beat the 2000 Ravens defensive scoring record uh, through eight games. So they're eight no. Um, and the Ravens blasted them 37 to 20 in a game that was, it was not that close. It, it, they, they, they dominated it thoroughly. Um, one of the things that after the game, and, and you still see this in Tom Brady today is a, a great deal of respect for Lamar, uh, coming out of that game. And Lamar ran for a touchdown. He, I, I don't remember how many touchdowns he threw for, but it was a, it was a tremendous Lamar performance in, in that game. Uh, worthy of the MVP there, and and Brady came after the game that was caught on somebody's microphone. You know, great game. I'm a big fan, kind of thing. And um, I I think to this day, we, you know, with him announcing the Cowboys game, you really heard a lot of that fanboyness coming out of of Tom Brady and and his respect for Lamar Jackson. Yeah, this game actually uh, sort of mirrors the Buffalo game to me in a way. Um, it just just you know an undefeated opponent coming in who. Uh, really, it's a question of have they been tested and how are they going to react to uh, Lamar? And they just both teams seem to be thoroughly unprepared for what the Ravens uh, were going to were going to throw at them. Um, and uh, and of course, uh, I think Baltimore had a at least on the fan base side had a bit of a chip on its shoulder. Uh, you know, people talking talking about how the New England Patriots, 2019 New England Patriots, were going to be the you know greatest defense of all time, and you know supplant the 2000 Ravens or any other team that you want to throw up there. And of course, the Ravens put that to rest with haste. There's a lot of 400 hitters in April, is what I always say with regard to this. There's there haven't been any 400 hitters on October 1st since 1941. So it's uh, it really you gotta you gotta endure the test of time to be the 2000 Ravens team and that's uh, that's really nice. It's always fun to do that show with you, Slava. Great trip down memory lane with these runs and these primetime wins. And I hope we have a chance to do one or two more of these episodes this season where you really reflect on was this the greatest something in Ravens history? Because it's it's kind of fun to do that. But uh, tell folks where they can talk football with you online. I'm on Twitter at Slava Cooperstein. That's S-L-A-V-A-K-U-P-E-R-S-T-E-I-N. All right. Other folks out there, hit me up if you'd like to be on a film study short. DMs are always open on Twitter for that. If you want to support the show, uh, you can like or subscribe. If you're if you're watching on YouTube, always nice to dra- drive traffic to the show in that way. Uh, you can also just show the, show the show to a friend. Take them to the website, show them how to play it directly there, and uh, hopefully get someone else interested in it. For Slava Cooperstein, this is Ken McCusick saying goodbye, and we'll talk to you next week on One Last Thing.